Okay, so this is uh, IFSU Q&A. First one that we're doing with Mike Robertson. Uh, rules are, if you're not talking, or even if, you've, even if you've asked a question and you're listening, please either put headphones in or mute your mic because when it echoes in the, the speakers, it cuts out Mike's voice so we can't hear the points that he's making. Um, if, if you don't do that, I'll probably just mute you myself. <laughs> um, who has questions? Does anybody want to raise a hand maybe? Patrick. I know you got so, one. Yeah, well, I just didn't <laughs> want to be first, you know. Like, <laughs> I don't want, all right, but um, something that I've really been wondering, Mike, is your assessment process when you work with an athlete or a client for the first time. So, do you have, have you read Ty and Tony's uh, manual, like the VVT manual? I haven't read it, but I know about it. I've listened to the podcast episode where they're featured on it. Yeah, so... I would say that's a good place to start. Um, I don't always necessarily get to do all the VBT stuff with the guys that I work with simply because I'm not comfortable that they're competent with the lifts, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. a lot of these guys, like, yeah, they know how to lift, but I'm not comfortable with their performance. So a lot of times I'm going to take them for a couple weeks and like build technique first. So the stuff that I'm going to do is generally very simple. I'll do like a 10 yard dash, maybe like a flying 10. Um, I like to do a battery of different jump tests. So we'll do like a static jump, like no counter movement. Uh, we'll do a counter movement jump, uh, like a depth jump, a four jump test. So you can see we got a lot of different jumps going on there. Uh, we'll do like a pro agility. So I just try and get like a general feel. And sometimes I'm looking at the numbers, but a lot of times for me, I'm looking at just the quality of their movement to start. So that's generally kind of what the first assessment piece looks like. But then something that I always try and do as well is once we do that, because I mean, depending on how quickly we're working, that may only take 40 minutes. So a lot of times this is their second session in the gym. So generally if they're at a level where I'm going to work with them, Bill is going to do the eval and then he's going to send them to me. Okay. So this is their second session. And you got to think they just spent an hour at some point with Bill Hartman with him exploding their brains, right? So I'm trying to bring them back to like reality. We're gonna do some athletic stuff. I'm gonna do all these things. And then I always wanna finish a session up with like some coaching of some sort. So maybe we're gonna squat, maybe we're gonna hinge. So things that they're at least somewhat familiar with and I'm gonna coach them so I can see how they move and then I'm gonna take that and I, I wanna actually get my hands on them a little bit and just show them like a lot of these guys think they know how to lift, because they've been in a collegiate program for three, four, or five years. And so I want to show them just a little bit, like demonstrate just a little bit about what we're all about, how we coach movement, how it's different from how they've learned it in the past, so that they kind of have this idea of, okay, this place is different, you know? Um, and so there's a little bit of salesmanship involved in the assessment process, but I don't think it's anything all that extraordinary, right? It's like the stuff that you guys are probably already doing um, or at least components or elements of it. Um, one thing that I would say too is a lot of times I try and video as much as I can so that, you know, there's a lot going on. So you just imagine I'm trying to set up the equipment, I'm running the test, I'm recording stuff. So there's a lot going on. So whenever I can, I try and record it with video as well. So I've always got that to fall back on. And so I think that's really the assessment process. And then from there, I start to put all those pieces together and start laying out that first program. For the collegiate guys that you work with, or the guys that had collegiate experience, what are like yeah. the biggest flaws or discrepancies that you see that they present with? Honest answer, they move like absolute shit. You know, almost across the board. Um, and I don't mean that as a knock on whomever is coaching them. But a lot of these guys, I mean, part of what makes them good is, you know, the, the degree of extension they have, right? Like they're toned up bros that makes them strong and fast and powerful. But most of these guys are so locked up and so rigid that they've lost pretty much all ability to bend. So my kind of like, if you think about how we put all these pieces together, like Bill is day one, right? And he starts to widen that movement window. He gives them a little bit of room to work with, which is great for me because now I've got some room to work with. 
And then from there, like we start layering those elements or those pieces because I mean, just basic lifts, right? Like a squat. So we had five guys that are, that came in this off season that were either like D one level um, or like going to be pros. And pretty much all of them could play professional basketball somewhere, either in the NBA or overseas. And I think two and maybe three out of the five, I had to start with like a plate reaching squat because their squat pattern was so bad. So just because a guy is skilled at a sport doesn't mean he moves well athletically. And I know that's kind of like, it doesn't make sense, but I find that time and time again, like just because a guy is an amazing basketball player doesn't mean he moves well in the gym. That doesn't mean we can't do a ton of great things for him that might look very simple to you and I, like they're very entry level with regards to our progressions, regressions, trainable menu, whatever you want to call it. But we can give them so much benefit from that. And I mean, I'm just thinking about a kid I'm working with right now. He's probably going to play in the NBA, right? Like he's probably going to play in the NBA, but I'm telling you what, I'm just destroying this guy with like push up to down dog, uh, step up to cross connect, uh, low cable split squat, goblet squats, like these very basic movements because I'm teaching them how to move the right way. I'm teaching them to use the right muscles. And the best part for me is like every day this kid's coming in, he's already practicing like five, six days a week. He's got his own weights program at school. And every day he comes in, he's just like, man, I just can't get over how good I feel. So that's kind of the thing for me is like, can I make these guys feel good first? Because the performance part, I mean, if I'm being honest, I feel like that's kind of easy. You know, yeah, there's people that are, that are really topped out. But I think so many of these guys feel awful and they don't know it. So if I can give them that first and then build all these physical tools or physical qualities that they're chasing, that's the easy part for me. But I got to lay the foundation first. What is your, when you, I guess when you're looking specifically at a squat pattern, what's yeah. that uh, assessment like? Are you having them do a bodyweight squat and you're seeing <laughs> just how they move? And yeah, move generally I'll just start with a bodyweight squat. Um, I can tell you, I mean, if we're talking like soccer guys are a little bit better for lack, for no other reason than the fact that they're so much closer to the ground, <laughs> you know, like most soccer guys are five, six, five, seven. Most of my basketball guys are six, seven or taller. So we'll start with a body weight squat. Um, most of my soccer guys very quickly can get into say a two kettlebell front squat or something of that nature. Um, but most of my basketball guys, they need to start with like a plate plate or a reaching squat first. Um, and a lot of them, it's the combination of a reaching squat with their heels elevated on like a slant board or something like that um, to try and get like the pelvis and the thorax on top of each other and teach them to kind of load, you know, a true squat pattern versus what they end up making into a hinge pattern where they sit really far back. Uh, quick question uh, for that. Uh, body weight squat. Yeah. Are you having them go uh, arms overhead for the assessment, or does that really? Generally not. Okay. Generally not. And here's why: like I know if most people can't squat with their arms out in front of them, the second I take their arms overhead and we start to yank on the lats, it's going to throw them into more extension. So yeah, for most of them, I mean, I know a lot of people use uh, an overhead squat or like a prisoner squat for the assessment but I just choose not to use that because I just don't feel like many people are very successful doing it. <laughs> Is every single athlete seen Bill first, regardless if they present with pain? My guys, yes. My guys, yes. Um, and I'll tell you why. Number one, um, I'd like to think at this point I'm pretty good on the floor, but in the assessment room, I would literally probably put any one of my guys ahead of me as far as assessments go at this point. Um, cause I just don't do that many. I don't do enough. Right. And again, if somebody's ready to play at like the professional level or they're already playing at the professional level, I want them to have the best treatment, right? I'm not the best person to assess them. So I'd much rather have Bill take care of that. Make sure he's, you know, got this guy has the correct resets. He's got the correct breathing patterns, all that stuff dialed in because it makes my job so much easier. Um, and I mean, look, you guys know Bill, like how many times has he done Q and A? Like this guy, like every week is onto something new, right? And, and in a good way, not just for the sake of finding something new, like he's connected another dot. So there's no way, even if I got caught up to him somehow, 
I mean, who knows how many assessments I would have to do to get there. But even if I could, then he would, he's already here. He's going to be that much further ahead of me. So it's like, make it easy. Get this person the best care possible. Give them to Bill. He and I obviously communicate ex extremely well. I know kind of what he's chasing when I see specific resets. And then that makes my job that much easier when I have to go and program for the person. Interesting. So then let's say <laughs> – um, the athlete you're working with, let's say he still has like sports, sport pre practice, yep. basketball practice. And the next day he comes in, he does, uh, some lift and he has knee pain. Yep. Does he immediately go see Bill or do you load differently to see if he will have a different response? It's an interesting situation because I don't work with so many guys in season. You know, a lot of my guys are here and then they go to their college or they go back to their team. Um, I would say, let's use the Indy 11 as an example, right? Um, so they have a trainer on staff. So he would be like their first, uh, their first step. Um, if they came into the gym, I would still try and see what I can do, right? Because there's a lot of times I see stuff and it's like, look, it's a pretty simple fix. You know, like once you start moving them around and they're like, oh yeah, I never really noticed that. Or you can just tell this person's super toned up today. So maybe you have to be uh, a little bit more specific and targeted with your resets than you would normally be. Maybe you have to coach them a little bit more. Um, but a lot of times I can get them, not that I am, I need to say this probably for, uh, for like the, how do I want to describe this? Just to cover my own ass, basically. I'm not yeah. here to get people out of pain. But, uh, you know, look, there's certain times where I can get somebody moving and feeling better just by getting them into a better starting position. Right. Um, but if it was something that was persistent, by all means, they're going to go see Bill. Now, um, uh, hold on. How do I want to phrase this? So for the example that Patrick just said with a basketball player who comes in with, um, knee pain and then you do some, um, I guess you could call them like regressions or whatever, or change their workout and exercises yeah. to make them feel better. But yeah. what were like the chances of them carrying that like movement pattern back, like onto the court or so to try and avoid. Cause I feel like that's, that's a big issue that I, I guess Patrick and I will come and see with the basketball guys that we work with. Yeah. We'll have them do um, go from, I will regress them. So they have less knee pain. Yep. But how do we, like, I guess, how do you make that, like, transfer over? So here's the answer you're probably not going to want to hear. It's just <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, time is, like, the big equalizer with all this, right? So you can mm -hmm. take the most dysfunctional person known to man. And if you have enough time, you can get them moving really well, right? So it all comes down to how dysfunctional are they mm -hmm. and how much time do you have to fix them up, right? Um, and I think that's, that's the bigger issue is, like, in my brain, the only times I haven't really been like, damn, I was super successful with this guy is when I haven't had enough time. So, you know, there's certain guys where I may only have them for, like, two weeks, you know, and we can put in really good work. Even if I see them every day, like, we can clean up their movement, their looking really good they're moving really well but it's not enough time to you know really kind of set everything in stone so i would say you're doing the right things like if you're doing things that are getting them out of pain that are getting them feeling better that are you know slowly but surely getting them better on the court you're doing everything that you can now it's like okay when will i have enough time with this person where they're not playing ball when I can get them in the gym, when I can really kind of get them moving the way that I want, that's when you'll start to see success. So I understand exactly where you're at. Like this is one of the hardest parts of like soccer in season. I mean, look, even if you're a bad team, you play nine months in a row. You know what I mean? So it's like these guys that start having issues in like July, man, we're just tying the rope and just trying to hold on until the season gets over. So I think you're doing all the right things. And you have to stay on top of that. You have to maybe give them a little bit of homework, right? Stuff that they can do on their own at home so they start feeling a little bit better, so they feel empowered, right? That they have tools in their toolbox they can use and then just kind of stay in their ear. And that's what I do. Like, look, okay. hey man, you feel this good now or you feel this good after a session, 
man, wait till your season's over and we really get to work. Like you're going to feel amazing. Gotcha. I think that's probably your best approach. It's, it's a time thing, man. You mm-hmm. know, and unfortunately that is just like in sports. That's our greatest constraint as coaches is yeah. how much time we have with a guy. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, kind of, this is, a. Uh related to the topic earlier about the assessments are those yep. basically more uh, mostly pri based or are they kind of mixed does or like what bill's doing but yeah yeah so bill would be the better person to ask i would say it's the bill hartman assessment at this point <laughs> okay. um and i don't say that to be cheeky at all but like bill i don't know bill is like constantly putting different pieces together and like there's things that um he is doing now that I think maybe surpass some of their tests. Um, so I would defer to him in that regard, but okay. you know, I think everybody's looking at the same things, right? Like when you really distill it down and Bill would describe it better than anybody, but how do they manage pressure? Where can they get air? Where can they not get air? That gives you a lot of clues as to where you need to start. Got it. Thanks. No problem. Bro, somebody is doing some shoulder work in the background. I love it. <laughs> I've with, got India 11, uh, with the Indy uh, 11 guys, are you working yeah. mostly in a t- bigger group setting? Yep. What's like the biggest challenges that you've noticed <clears throat> when you work with a large group setting like that versus a semi-private or uh, private setting in iFest? So I always describe when I work with the guys, you got to imagine it's 20 dudes, right there. It's in the middle of their training week. They practice probably an hour and a half, two hours earlier in the day, sat around for an hour and a half, two hours, and then came in to me to work out. All right. So a couple issues, you're always going to have the motivation issue of them coming in. And I'm lucky because most of my guys have been around long enough and I've got enough rapport. There's no issue right with them getting up, but there's a handful of guys Anytime you have 20 dudes, there's going to be five that aren't super interested in working out, right? So you always struggle with that a little bit. And then it really just comes down to coaching quality. Like I've had a lot of time coaching these guys. So, I mean, I can turn my back on 19 guys and feel pretty comfortable with how they're going to move. But, you know, there's always one or two guys that just don't move as well that I need to spend more time with. And it can really kind of show up when you get try lists in. So like say a couple guys get injured, they may bring guys in on trial or they might bring them in for a short period of time. So this is a guy I've never seen work out before and he's in the gym and he's, you know, trying to fit in. So he's trap barring 240, which may not sound like a lot to you, but to a lot of these soccer guys is a decent enough amount of weight. So you're worried there. So, I mean, just the, the quality of coaching isn't as good as I would like. And then really the final piece is a lot of these guys come in and they're kind of dinged up. You know, and so, yeah, they have an ATC. Um, Yes, they have a PT. But a lot of these guys I've got just really good relationships with. So if they've got like an ache, a pain, or a boo-boo, they may not want to tell the ATC. They might not want to tell the coach because they want to be in the 17 for the week or they want to be in the starting 11 that week. So that's when things get really tricky is when I've got two or three separate guys who I'm trying to give specialized work to or who I'm trying to get my hands on and work with a little bit and I got another 16, 17, 18 guys behind me that are doing their own thing. So I think it's really just a management issue. Um, but I think the biggest benefit is being there four years now, I'm pretty comfortable with how most of the guys move. I know how I need to keep my eyes on. So it's really just like a day-to-day, week-to-week thing. Like how much individual attention does each guy need? And then trying to make sure this is a really critical thing, I think is making sure you touch every guy at least once during session, right? Like even your guys that aren't into it, you know, you'll be shocked. Like those guys may not pay any attention to you all year. And I've had this a couple times now, but come September when their body's breaking down and they don't know who to talk to or what's going on, they'll come to you and they'll ask for help. So that's just one piece of advice I would give you in that large group setting. Try and make a connection point with each guy and it's tough because it's 45 minutes to an hour. But if you do that, it's going to pay dividends down the line. When you say touch, you mean like make a connection with, not physically yeah. touch? Yeah, because okay. yeah. <laughs> that, that would be weird. Maybe not. I mean, 
Lance could pull it off. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I can, you know. Depends on the day. Uh, I'll say something knowing a little bit how Mike programs too. He doesn't put himself in, in a position to fail with, uh, when it comes to programming. And so that's a big piece too. So I just wanted to toss that in there. Kudos that's to him. I try and make it very dummy proof. As I tell the interns every week, I'm lazy. But in a good way. I was going to say lazy too, but not for you. But like, like every decision that I make, it's like, I want you to be able to do this if I'm not there, you know, yes. ideally. So let me, let me clarify that point because there will be somebody that walks out of here that says, well, Mike Robertson's lazy. I'm lazy with the mindset of, yeah, Lance probably. The reason I say that is I want to be lazy because like Lance said, if I'm not there, they need to be able to execute it. Right. Or, Maybe even more importantly, I want them to be able to execute things without me having to coach them, right? Because I know the more they're learning and exploring in a safe environment on their own, the better off they're going to be. So I want to give them exercise like a goblet squat, right? Like that's why Dan John first started talking about goblet squats because you can't screw it up, right? We can, but it's very hard to do versus say a barbell back squat, which is much more coaching intensive. It's a lot more work, not only as a coach, but as an athlete. So I always try and find exercises that are harder to fail on that they can be successful with. And I think that makes just life in general a lot easier as a coach. Going back to your, your time and your coaching intensiveness, like if you, that, that allows you to focus on the one dude who needs a lot of work and the other 19 are then good. Yes, absolutely. I'm just having flashbacks of the one guy from like two years ago. He was from Mexico. He spoke no English and literally he looked like a turtle every time he deadlifted. It made me very nervous. <laughs> I thought his spine was going to end up somewhere. <laughs> somewhere that wasn't him. Yes. <laughs> um, Alex, you got anything? I don't know anything about hockey. <laughs> you got to learn. Man. This. You got to no learn. Out there. There's no hockey out there. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so more for your, your, your warm up or movement prep, however you want to call it. Sure. Uh, more so like the readiness section. Yeah. I know that you kind of take like a uh, de neurodevelopmental approach, you know, like baby positions. Yeah. Where do you start or how do you select the exercises? Because I mean, there's, for me, I know like a lot of people can, improve upon you know dead bug or like three month position leg lowers you know stuff like that but where do you go or how do you select those exercises i know it's based on the assessment approach but yeah. is there a specific way that you know like no matter who it is or let's say the soccer team for example in the yep. 11 yep like your your war your readiness section is yep. there you know is there um a way that you kind of select the exercises or yeah, and I'll give you two different examples, right? So I'll give you like in season where they've already been on the pitch, they've already done stuff. So it's a little bit different for those sessions, right? So generally how that works out, um, and I'll just take you R1 to R3, right? Like they'll generally come in, they roll out on their own, two o'clock hits, um, they've kind of got global resets, right? And mm -hmm. there are certain guys that have specific things that they've either gotten from me or Bill over the years but generally everybody's going to do like an all four belly lift and everybody's going to do like a 90, 90, mm -hmm. right? So just try and reposition them, at least get their rib cage and their pelvis somewhat over the top of each other. Right. And then from there, like, I mean, do you remember the core performance book that Mark Verstegen wrote? Yeah. Like in 15 oh, yeah, like, years ago? Like right over here. Yeah. <laughs> Literally like a lot of that is just my dynamic warm up. You know right. what I mean? But then I'll sprinkle in um, different movement pieces, right? So maybe it's, an A skip or a B skip. Um, maybe we'll work on, you know, different like pieces of rhythm or, you know, elements like that, but it's not that crazy. Like I'm just trying to get them warmed up and loose again before they go in the gym. Now to be more specific, like in an off season where somebody's got a more customized program, generally what you're going to see is we'll do their resets. And then I like to go in and do some form of ground based work to start. Right. Because I just feel like so many people still struggle um, to lock this area down. So for some people, maybe it's like a core engaged hip flexion. Right. Hmm. If that's easy. Then we could take that into like a supine arm bar. 
right? So now we've got a more active reach with an active hip flexion. Um, so you're always going to see some element like that, I feel like. A lot of times there's going to be something to drive a little bit more air into the backside, like a rock back breathing on elbows, something of that nature. Sometimes it's more like a cat camel. And I know that's kind of archaic sounding, but like just getting their actual lumbar spine to move again and get them to flex again. Cause I mean, I'm just shocked. Like how many athletes just cannot flex like any joint. Right. But like their spine being kind of an important one. So we'll start off with ground based stuff. Um, and you know, if they need it, we'll go into quadruped or half kneeling. But a lot of times then once I get them just some reference for where their back is, getting their abs turned on, kind of cementing and locking in that core position that we want, then I'm going to go in, we're going to do a blend up, um, just kind of like I was talking about before, like what I like to do is blend something that does trains mobility, right? Like a high knee hug or like a marching cross connect. And then I'll take that into an A skip. Um, or I'll take a single leg RDL, um, do that for five reps each leg. And then I'll take that into a scissor skip. Um, and just kind of layer some of those patterns. Maybe it's a lateral lunge or a lateral split squat we'll take that into a lateral shuffle or like a defensive shuffle. So, you know, it's this blend of, think of it like, like you're basically trying to smooth that transition, right? So if you've ever seen the R7 talk, R1, R2, R3. So R3, you're trying to blend, not just the warm up, but you're trying to blend into the movement skills that you're gonna teach that day. Um, and I know Ty's listening, he'd probably do a better explanation of this than I would, but again, just trying to smooth that out so that they're starting to understand like contextually where I want them, right? And it just gives me more chances to teach good movement because I may not teach, say, lateral agility every day with an athlete, but we're at least getting some reps in where they shift from side to side, where they work on explosively pushing. So that's basically how I'm setting up the warm ups right now. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, no, totally. Uh, do you, so do you progress the warm up as, so per, per block, do you progress the warm up in terms of, um, well, obviously like if it's like more difficult, more challenging, or is that yeah. just dependent on the person completing the movement? So again, keeping in mind the limited scope of time that I generally have with guys, right. um, if I have them for an extended period, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but most of my guys, even in a best case scenario in the off season, if I get eight to 10 weeks, like that's amazing. If anything, what you're probably going to see is an upgrade in the resets. Right. Right. And then the rest of the workout is more challenging. So if I had somebody for longer than I typically do, then absolutely I would freshen up the warm up. Um, but just the short amount of time that I typically have people, I do not. Okay. All right. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure, man. This was good. Uh, who's next? I guess I can go. Yes. Oh, intern Corey. We kind of touched on like the resets and the weight room stuff. Can you talk yeah. about, I guess, your approach to conditioning for the soccer players? In season or out of season? Um, both and how they're different. Bro, how long do we have? Lance, what time is it? I'm I know too. Yeah. You got 28 minutes before okay. I got to go eat dinner. <laughs> yeah, we're on different schedules. So in season, young Corey, um, I don't have to do a ton of conditioning. And I'm being judicious with how I say this, because if I was on the field every day, I would be doing a lot more of this type of stuff, right? Um, I think one of the great failures in our world right now is not not bringing people all the way back from a conditioning standpoint when they go and return to play right so you're doing all the right things strength wise and oh yeah they look good like strength is symmetrical but there's a lot of other things that are important other than just strength right so it's speed it's power development it's ground contact time like uh I know years ago, this probably isn't new now, but like they were looking at ACLs, right? And they look at side to side asymmetries. And, you know, if you look at just strength side to side, oh yeah, you're good to go. But then if you look at ground contact time and how they're producing that strength or how they're producing that force, like that affected or that surgically repaired knee is not the same. 
So, you know, when you take that kind of mindset to conditioning, I think this is where a lot of people miss the boat. Like, yeah, they might check the boxes from the strength perspective, or they might check a box from a mobility perspective, but you can't take a guy that sat out for the last four weeks and throw him out there and expect him to play six minutes the first week back. And Mike, just to piggyback, they're also not testing that in, in any like type of fatigue condition, even semi-fatigue condition, right? So like you just, the, that strength test is somewhat irrelevant yes. until it becomes a strength test under stress. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, when it comes to the conditioning piece, like that's one of the best things that you can do in season is kind of monitor the guys and the way I always describe it is, especially in soccer, it's hard because if you have a full team, which we don't have right now, but like in years past, say you have 24 guys, you've got probably 15 that are playing a decent amount of minutes every week, which means you've got, well, let's not count the goalies, but you've probably got at least another five or six guys where they need work, like they need supplemental work. And you know, especially when you get into these parts of the season where you've got, say, three matches and eight games, it's really hard because now these guys, not only are they losing fitness, but they're not practicing either, right? Because it's all about managing the other guys and getting them ready for the game. So that's where, number one, the coach has to be on board. They've got to understand when they have opportunities to stress uh, the reserves and get them the work that they need. And you as a coach, like, when we traveled with the team the first year and, and Ty will probably remember this, but like when we would finish up a game, like if a guy didn't play more than 30 minutes, they were running at the end, right? Like we take them on the field. Everybody else is shaking hands and kissing babies and doing whatever they do. Like we're getting about 10 to 15 minutes of high intensity work in, Right. And I think we did a good job of that because it was a lactic aerobic. It's, you know, maybe we go sideline to sideline. They got 10 seconds. They got 50 seconds off. So it's like a one to five work to rest. We're going to do that 10 times. They get a little workout in. Their fitness is where it needs to be. They feel like they did something, right, which psychologically is really important. Win or lose, you know, these reserves can struggle psychologically if you don't keep your eyes on them. So that's what we do in season. Off season, this is actually your guys' talk next week. So I'm not going to give you all the details now, but you have to think pyramid, right? You have to think big base, right, up to high-intensity lactic stuff at the top. Um, and, and maybe a better way to describe it, and I don't have like a whiteboard or anything, but you think alactic, lactic, aerobic, right? And the two that don't compete are the alactic and the aerobic. So I generally work on both ends of the spectrum, right? So I'm working some alactic stuff, short sprints, high-intensity but full, like complete rest along with long duration, lower intensity stuff. And we kind of, you know, if we've got a V here, right? And over the course of the off season, we narrow that up to where, you know, right before they go to camp, we're going to do some lactic stuff. Um, not only to get them prepared for the conditioning test that I know that they're going to go through, but man, quite frankly, just because a coach is a good soccer coach doesn't mean he understands physiology. So there's a lot of times these coaches are going to try and, you know, make a statement and they're going to really get these guys fit those first two to three weeks of camp. So, I mean, unfortunately, you can know all the right things to do, but I think giving them a two to three week lactic block before they go to camp does a lot of good stuff for them because the way I kind of always rationalize this is what I don't want to have happen is I have an athlete that goes to camp and the first time they've been lactic in three to four months is the first day of practice. So I want to expose them to that and then figure out, you know, okay, hey, how much can I give them without taking away from all the other good stuff that we've done in the offseason? Does that help, Corey? Yes. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Mike. Allison yeah, wants yeah. to know how you pair the conditioning and the strength stuff together specifically. This is in three weeks for you guys. <laughs> um, so this is still something that I think, okay, look, first off, everything that we do is a process, right? So it's never perfect. It's never exactly how you want. 
So if you think about, let's say I have three blocks, because this is my, Mike Robertson's perfect world where I have nine to 12 weeks with an athlete. So block one is your accumulation block. So we're going to do like accumulation weights, like short rest intervals. We're going to just build, actually, let's go even up a notch higher. So like movement is just going to be like rebuilding movement patterns, like, you know, making sure their sprint pattern or their sprint technique looks okay, whether it's acceleration, lateral, whatever pieces we're working on there. Just retooling some of that. Weights are generally going to be focused on like accumulation. So even on my mains, um, instead of three by 10 or three by eight, I'm going to flip those. So six by three, eight by three, 10 by three, something like that. Uh, I like that a lot because it keeps relative intensity higher and quality stays higher as well. Because we all know if you're doing a heavy set of eight or 10, seven, eight, nine, 10, you're just trying to get through. So quality stays higher, keeps things alactic. I think it does a lot of good stuff. Um, the rest of the, the workout is going to be generally accessory type stuff, cleaning up movement, that block. And then for conditioning, on workout days, it'll generally be higher intensity stuff. Um, for some soccer guys, it may be tempo work. It kind of depends on what I feel like they need. But think short burst, say five seconds intensity with a prowler, a sled, dead tread, something like that, and then full recovery, so like 90 seconds off. So that's generally the accumulation block. The second block is going to be um, obviously higher intensity, um, plyos, med ball throws, um, agility, for lack of a better term, elements, speed training elements. That's going to be more of our max force block. So pushing probably the heaviest weights that we're going to push. Um, for a lot of the athletes, I used to call it like a, uh, a pseudo max strength block because I never really worked them up to like heavy singles but you know, like a decently heavy triple. Well, Ty and Tony just came up with a better description. It's a force block, right? So force block for the mains, your assistance work is all gonna be upgraded, you know, progressed, hopefully assuming they're moving well. And then as you start getting into the conditioning for that piece, what you're gonna see is on your main days, we're still gonna go short five to six second bursts, but we're gonna start cutting into that rest period, right? So if this is all about power, now we're start, starting to see, can they maintain it, right? And can we speed up the recovery in between rounds? And on the off days, I used to do mass running, like uh, max aerobic speed running. Now I much prefer tempos. Um, I, think it's, I think it's just a superior way to go. Um, maybe James Smith has just brainwashed me enough and Kier have brainwashed me enough to believe that that's the way to go. But um, I really like that. I've seen no change in the guys' aerobic fitness when they show up to camp. Um, and I think they maintain some of their, for lack of a better term, fast twitch properties for a longer period of time. And then that last block is, you know, kind of like your max power block, right? So we're trying to bring all those pieces back together. So highest intensity jumps, throws, sprints, um, even in the weight room, I haven't gotten to dabble as much with this, but you know, really trying to push the power into the spectrum. I'm really going to back off on the accessory stuff, maybe just two sets um, of that, just trying to maintain where they're at. Because by the time they do all of that, right, all of that high intensity stuff in the beginning, they do a little bit of assistance work, and then we do lactic work at the end. Like that's an awful session. Um, and so the last piece of conditioning there, I'm trying to think. I generally have three different days. I have one day that's like straight up like 15 on, 15 off, which is just awful. And it's a longer duration. So like in the gym, it's 25 yards. And they just see how many they can do. The other day, I want to say it's like maybe eight or 10 on and like starting at 40 seconds off and I start cutting their rest. But here's the key here. It's a 10-yard shuttle. Okay. And the reason I do a 10 yard shuttle is because there's so many cuts. They're constantly breaking down, turning. Because a lot of times people will tell you like with a lot of these conditioning tests, it's not just the, the conditioning part that's hard, like their legs are heavy, right? Because they have to change directions so much. Not to mention in soccer, you change directions, speed up, slow down like 1400 times in a match. So I'm trying to build them up in that, 
that regard as well. So kind of a very long winded answer, but that'll at least give you some idea of how I stack, you know, the movement, the weights and the conditioning across each of the three blocks. And if I didn't do a good job, I'll do a better job in three weeks when I give you the real talk. And then based off of that, does recovery change based off of what you're training? The other day you were training an athlete um, and you started with some tempo work in the beginning, but then you ended up doing elasticity work at the end. And, or you started with elasticity and you did some tempo work at the end. Yes. And you don't pair those two together. Yeah. I was if that would affect recovery based off of doing the two together. It might. Um, mostly they're just – kind of competing demands, right? Because one is very focused on the muscle, right? And one is very focused on the stretch shortening cycle and using elastic energy. So they're, they're kind of diametrically opposed. And like I said, with this kid, I'm just trying to just get some general training in with him. And I want to see how he's moving because even though I had him for a while earlier this year, it was like six sessions across like four or five weeks. So I don't think it's going to impact his recovery all that much because overall, the intensity is pretty low right now. Um, but as I kind of root him out, as I explained to you the other day, like once we get about three weeks in, I'm gonna put him through the whole testing profile again, see how he tests, and then I'm gonna get really targeted and specific with where I go from there. Are these training blocks, um, are these for during the off season? Yeah. Yeah, almost all, all of the guys that I get, other than, uh, other than soccer, are off-season. Um, and it's varying windows. I mean, I've had guys, best-case scenario, I'll get them for 12 weeks. Um, but, like, Chad Marshall, he's, like, the, the prime example right now. He had a three-and-a-half-week off-season this year. So, you know, there's – you just kind of make do with what you got. I mean, not ideal, but, yeah. The – it's interesting now because I do have one guy that I'm working with um, who plays college basketball and I'm working with him twice a week. But I mean, if you guys saw his workouts, I mean, it's so Spartan, like it's so basic, like the weight room that we're in is they got nothing. So like I literally take a band with me, I take a kettlebell with me. Um, and again, for him, this is a guy who legitimately, if he does well, should be playing in the NBA next year. Um, and I know he's getting weights at school, so I'm not trying to be the guy for him. All I'm trying to do is get him moving better, keep him feeling good, um, just looking at him move. Um, I had some concerns, especially early on, so I'm trying to clean those up because if this guy can stay healthy, if he can stay available, you know, there's a high likelihood he's going to make some good money playing basketball. So he's going to be interesting. So ask me in a couple months when I can talk more about him. For sure. Um, what's the – you work with the Indy 11 guys during the in-season too, right? Yes. What's the in-season planning like? Well, you know, here's the thing. We've had four seasons, and I've had four different plans because every coach has a different way of doing things, right? The last two years have been more consistent um, and maybe not in the best way. I'll give you a couple examples. So the first year um, – the way we had it set up, Tuesday was our main lifting day, right? And in soccer, the whole, the whole world revolves around the match, right? So Saturday, you have a match. Sunday, you have recovery. Monday, you have off, typically. And then Tuesday, in this case, was a training session and then a lifting session. And then part of that year, we would come in on Thursday and do a, uh, like a workout on the pitch, right? So we'd bring bands or whatever, and we'd do a session there. The second year, midway through the season, the main coach got fired. The assistant coach got promoted. He loved what we did. So we actually got them twice a week in the gym. So every Tuesday, every Thursday. And that's the year I will hang my hat on as a strength coach because in the average soccer world, 10 guys every year or 10, years, or 10 guys on every club every year on average will miss a game because of a soft tissue injury right? So a hamstring, a calf, a quad. That year we had five soft tissue, like muscle pulls the whole season that caused guys to miss games. And that's including one or two where it was like a guy would miss a match. So 
I feel like that was some of our best work. Um, but we had a coach that 100% bought into what we were doing. We had a guy that was um, John Cone. Um, if you've ever heard of him, he's got, I've got a podcast with him on my site. He did all like the physical periodization. So he planned the entire like training schedule, like what days are you going to go hard? What days are you going to go light? How high or low is the intensity going to be in each session? So that second year was like the perfect year from my perspective, because we could put our best guys out there every single week. The last two years, it's a little bit different setup, and we've been going on Wednesday. So we have one session a week. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Like um, we'll mix it up. Some days we'll squat. Some days we'll trap bar. Um, we're going to do some sort of single leg or split stance work. We're going to do some form of upper body pressing, depending on how I feel like they're going to respond. A lot of days I try and keep bench in. I think psychologically, these are their dudes, right? They like to bench. Um, but also it's a long season. And something Dave Tinney said to me years ago really stood out. It's like you get into July and August and these guys lean body mass is coming down. They're losing weight you know, over the course of the season. So anything I can do to try and spare some of their muscle mass, uh, I think is valuable. And then we're going to wrap every session with some sort of hamstring, like knee, well, knee flexion work, but really it's like anti-knee extension. So think like ball leg curls, Nordic, something of that nature, and some sort of ab work. So that's what a general session looks like. And like I said, I get them like once a week, if a guy doesn't travel, sometimes I'll get him on Fridays as well. Um, and I've got one or two guys that are, they're just savvy vets and they, they kind of see the value in this and they'll actually come in on Mondays, you know, but it's generally just one or two guys that, you know, kind of understand, look, I'm 37, 38. If I want to play at a high level, I got to take care of my body. So they come in and get some extra work in early in the week. As a follow up to that, like when you're working with someone at that level, um, is strength training making them better per se, or is it more on the resiliency, robustness? Uh, uh, can we, can we, uh, Lance, can we get Mike Ron Karate on this? <laughs> Should we quote him? Yeah. Mike Ron Karate would tell you, keep in mind, he's worked at the NBA level for five, six, seven years now. That, he's with the Hawks, right? Uh, what's that? He's with the Hawks. He's with the Hawks. And he has yeah. an NBA ring. <laughs> he does have a ring, an NBA one. So depending on the day you get wrong, like there's days he'll flat out say like, we don't matter. Right. Because look, these guys are the best. Um, here's what I think. And I think most of you, if you think about this for a second, would tend to agree. The lower level you go to the bigger impact training has. Right. So like you look at LeBron James or Steph Curry, like Steph Curry actually, I guess is a pretty savage beast in the weight room, but Let's assume they never work out, right? They're the most skilled basketball players in the world. And now Ty's probably rolling his eyes too because I said LeBron James is skilled. But I say this because, like, think about, think about the kids that you work with in high school. And you give them a little bit more athleticism. Now that makes them a better player, right? But they're never going to be as good as the kid that's the most talented. And you got to think, at the, the elite level, like, they're the best for a reason. Like, the guys that get serious about this, it could give them an edge. And I think the guys that are really good and that play the longest understand that this gives them an edge. But I think you answered your own question. Like one of the biggest things that this can do for guys is the resiliency. It can keep them healthy. It can get them an extra contract. So, you know, this is what makes it interesting when it comes to selling what you do, right? Because if a guy's on the edge, then I can sell him with, look, man, like we get you a little bit more physical, we can get you there, right? But if a guy's already there, the sales pitch is different. It's like, look, you're already there. Maybe I want to make you better. Um, and if he's an older guy, maybe it's not even about getting any better anymore. Maybe, hey, look, can I get you another two or three year deal? Because I mean, I don't know if you follow the NBA, like that money's just silly. Like, but with a lot of my guys, it's it's all about resiliency. It's about keeping them healthy. It's about keeping them on the pitch. Um, and what's fun is like the guys that really buy in, you see it, right? Like, I mean, I'm going to talk about him at some point here later on, but we got a guy named Brad ring and the first two years he played with us, he was, 
you know, coming out of the MLS. So it was kind of a shock to his system a little bit. I don't know how into weights he was. And this guy, I bet two, three times a year, had some sort of serious muscle pull. You know, it was a hamstring or a groin or something. And in between years two and three, he got serious about the weight room. You know, he trained really hard that offseason. He kept up with it all of last year. He trained with me this last offseason. He's been consistent all this year. Knock on wood, that guy hasn't had a muscle pull in two years. So it's like those are the success stories, you know. But like you said, you answered your own question. How much performance improvement are we getting? It's really hard to say. Um, you know, the longer the offseason, the bigger of an impact you can have. But ultimately, I think one of the most important things to remember is, look, you can add years to these guys' careers. You can keep them healthier for the years that they do play. So that's what it's all about for me. And, man, look, I hate to say that because nobody likes to chase performance more than I do. Like, I love watching people run fast and jump high and lift heavy things. But, you know, if we're being totally honest, like, the best of the best, I don't know about Lionel Messi, but he doesn't look like he's super jacked. But he's pretty fucking good at soccer. So I try and remind myself of that. Sure, appreciate that. Yep. Got time for one more. Fabrizio, you got one? Yeah. Can yes, you hear me, guys? Oh. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, um, switching gears a little bit here. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know what are your, your good go-to exercises to – promoting, you know, a posterior tilt of the scap or lower trap recruitment in, say, uh, an individual who presents with anteriorly tilted uh, shoulder blades and how to make that good change stick. I, I mean, uh, prone trap raises, shoulder, uh, shoulder Ws, they're all great, but how do we make that posterior tilt uh, stick um, in the weight room? Yeah. So before I'm thinking any exercises, I'm thinking foundation, right? So a lot of times when people come in with this kind of posture, you know, they're so locked up and they're not getting any airflow into their chest. Before I ever think about exercises, I'm thinking about where can they not drive air and can I get air moving there, right? So that's like priority one. Um, now, once I start to get air where I want it, I'll tell you some of my favorite exercises, um, and they're not what I used to use back in the day, but I, I still, I love PNF progressions. So what I'll generally do to really reinforce these two things, right? You know, hook lying position. So like laying on your back, but feet up on a box with knees bent. So I love hook lying and then going into like a PNF pattern from there because it does so it does so many good things, right? Like immediately you feel lower trap, you can lock in an ab, you can drive airflow into that chest wall, which we know most of these people need anyways, right? Now the big thing here uh, is that we have to teach people when they do exercises like that to reach, right? Versus most people think it's all about how far you move. So they try and get their hand to the floor and then they end up shrugging or they're using other muscles. Right. So I think it's all about setting position first, getting air where you want it second, and then third, using an exercise that allows you to combine all those elements and coaching and cueing it effectively. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I know it's not like a cool exercise, but I think that's the way you actually make it stick, right? Because otherwise, if you just go exercises at a bad foundation, it's never going to stick. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Thanks for getting up. I got uh, one quick question if we have time. Yeah. Um, so when I was at Cressy, they did a PRI drill. It was um, supine, and it was just the right-handed pitchers who did this, or right-handed throwers. Supine, right arm overhead, mm -hmm. left knee flex and adducted, mm -hmm. I think it was. Uh-huh. And so you close off the left side and try and fill up the right. Yeah. Is there a way to make that work for left-handed throwers or would you just flip that or because I know the uh, I guess the anatomy kind of favors the right side for that part but do I have a lifeline Lance <laughs> maybe is Ty still on 
He's there, baby. What He's ready. Time. He trains left-handed pitchers. He'll give you a call. <laughs> you green did light? You the question, Ty? Yeah, I did. Do you okay. want me to go? Yeah. Oh, okay. You train, you train uh, left-handed pitchers. I don't. I, I feel like that's the only – I must have a sign on my back that says, if you're a lefty uh, – <laughs> Come train uh, a tie. You're right. Um, that is weird. Like, I only get lefties. Um, it's – the anatomy is what it is, right? And, you, and we're not going to change that. And, you, and, and it's going to affect righties and lefties different, and you know that, right? And we all know that. Um, so those issues – like, lefties have issues just like righties, but they have different issues. Um, and so they may have a hard time staying like on the rubber, like back. They may fall off because maybe they can't lower their left hip or they don't have a left ab that keeps them back. Uh, maybe they're like, they fly open into extension because they don't, you know, have that left ab that can control, uh, kind of prevent that extension coming off the rubber. Um, with that said, I spent some time, I think it was like a year or so ago with Alan Groover. And it was so obvious that um, he trains what's in front of him. And I know that sounds really like simple and like before, like, you know, we knew what we know, you know, I, we all kind of did that. We said, Oh, this is what my eyes are showing me. This is what I have to do. Um, so it's very possible that you cannot get airflow on both sides. That's actually very common. Um, and, and so you can actually like one thing that happens a lot that needs to be done is like to shut off a, a peck, whether it's left or right. And you can make that change. Like, let's say we need to shut off a left peck. You can make that change um, with your left arm overhead or your right arm overhead. Um, you can do that. And I, you know, I've seen it done. So it's uh, um, train what's in front of you. So if you see a guy that doesn't get air into his left chest wall, train it. Um, because some of these guys are flipped. And just because they're, they don't fall into a neat category, um, it doesn't mean that what's in front of you is a lie. Because right? there's a lot of guys that when you walk into like a major league locker room or a college one, they don't fit into a cat. They don't fit into a nice neat category. They have elements of it, um, but they've got there's layers to the the, the ways they've compensated. Uh, and so if you see it, work on it. That, that okay. just would be my advice. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Because they got to get their arms overhead too, right? So you got to yeah. get air in the chest wall to go back to that uh, last question. Like you've got to get, you know, the post the cat the scaps got to posteriorly tilt. That the best way to get that done. Maybe the only way is to get air in that chest wall. And so, yeah, I mean, their demands don't change. Their demands are no different than the right side. They just have um, the variables act on them a little bit differently. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Does that no. help, Mitchell? Is there yeah. anything to do you want to add? Um, no, I think I was just going to ask him if he worked with someone I knew, um, and Eric Stout. Oh, you know that's that Mike's name? guy. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> you, oh, so you, do you know him from uh, CP? Yeah, Eric Stout and Radley Haddad. Yeah. yeah. So I worked with – Radley worked with us for probably three or four off-seasons. Mm -hmm. Amazing human being. Yeah, like, real good guy. Being and Stout – he spent maybe one off season with us and keep in mind when I say with us, like they always would start with us and they always end up at CP. Um, but yeah, stout was with us for at least one, if not two off seasons and dude, kind of a clown. Yeah. I knew him when he was like 20. Um, and Radley's just super mature for his age. So they definitely kind of were different, different, uh, just personality yeah. types, but yeah, just both awesome guys in stout. Man, that dude's gonna be sounds like on a forty man next year. So he's yeah. very happy for him. I think he made a big league spring training this year or something, or this past year. Yeah. So well, I think he was the Royals like Triple A pitcher of the year. Oh, I didn't know that. Like, like yeah, he had a really good year. So good for him, man. I'm yeah. excited to see him. Yeah. Mitchell, if you don't mind, I'll add one yeah. more thing on top of that. Sorry, it just came to mind. One thing and. If you understand what that athlete has to do, so like for a left-handed pitcher, if you understand like they have to create left trunk rotation separation from the hips, um, and then you ask, okay, what mechanically is left trunk rotation? Well, that's apical expansion and, and, and on the left and so forth. So if you know what they're going to have to do mechanically, uh, you know whether it's in the batter's box or on, on the mound, um, you test to see if they can do those things. Mm -hmm. And then you train what they can't do, or okay. you try to fix 
it's what they can't do. So that's probably a cleaner answer than what I gave you before and a more direct one. Um, but know what they have to do and then, you know, make sure they can do it. Gotcha. So it's not as simple as just kind of flipping the uh, positions for from ready to lefty. Oh, it can be. So what if, um, so if I, if I can't get left trunk rotation and separate from my pelvis, um, well, I, I'm going to need a right ab and I'm going to need left apical expansion. Okay. And so you, that's going to feed left trunk rotation. And okay. So I just want those things without sacrificing other things like a left ab or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, those are things they still have to be able to do because some people can't do, can't go either way. Right. They're just kind of yeah. stuck. Yeah. Uh, and so sometimes you got to give them a side and you got to make sure, but ultimately you have to make sure they can do what they need to do uh, on the mound. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Pat, sorry to butt in. Would you give them like a PNF and focus on one side or even a chop and just do the one side to get that airflow into um, the lung, whether it's left or right lung? Or would I mean, you still do both sides? You could. I mean, there's benefit for doing, being able to do it both sides, like because they're going to have to rotate the other way to finish their throw. Right, yeah. Uh, and so, or you'll see a side bend. So if I'm a lefty and I can't rotate to the right to finish my throw, you'll see a side bend. Mm -hmm. um, or you'll see them spin off really hard uh, because they didn't side bend, but they stayed super extended. And so the only thing for them to do is to twist off or, or, or kind of spin off the mound. Um, so you'll see like their, their drag mark. It's kind of cool. We've well, got a pitcher who taught me this, but their toe drag mark won't be a straight line. It'll be this really big arc. Uh, mm -hmm. If they're not rotating their trunk to finish the throw, they're rotating everywhere else. So it's kind of mm -hmm. cool. You can just go walk on the mound and say, oh, this guy needs to rotate better this way. Right. And would you, would you, uh, change the breathing patterns, um, in the PNF, like maybe inhale at the, at the fully extended position and then exhale to get more airflow into that side. I mean, even though you're still doing both sides, like, would you change up kind of how you get airflow or how you would breathe into that position? Yeah. So what, when I'm thinking about that stuff, one of my rules is, um, you know, get a zone, I get an ab, and then challenge your ability to keep it. And so you might have to close it off to get it at first, but then old, like eventually you got to start lengthening that lever and, and keeping an ab in an extended position because uh, you have to increase the capacity and your ability to maintain that ab at, at higher intensities, right? Because when they go on this, you know, whether it's on the mound or whatever they do, whether it's just lifting or, or throwing, um, the intensity goes way up. And so they have to, uh, kind of train the quality to, to be able to keep that ab in that higher intensity length and lever position. Uh, so I'm always moving from like a short lever to a long lever and then to a dynamic. Right. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, guys. It's bedtime. Well, for us East time people. <laughs> uh, I thought that was a really good way to kind of summarize a lot of, you know, get, get Ty's perspective on stuff. Um, Mike, do you have any, just to put you on the spot here, have any like parting words for anyone? Maybe a, a, a particular point that you think was more important or maybe something that happened today, just a little anecdote or something you want to practice. I don't know. Can I give um, them the motivational speech that is also coming on my podcast tomorrow? Do it. Uh, so all of you that are listening in, um, this is something that I, I've been thinking a lot about here lately is just like, like the mentorship process. Cause I think it's something that is unique with what we do at iFast. Um, it's, I, I don't know of any other place that does it exactly like we do it. Not that you have to do it exactly like we do it, but something that I want everybody to try and do a better job of just in our industry is finding ways to give back to other coaches. And I think that the way that I described it on the show is, is find a way to be the mentor that you wish you had. Right. So like for me, when I was 22 and I knew I wanted to be in this world, I never found somebody that was like, Hey Mike, let me show you like how this is done or like, let me take you under my wing and I'm going to teach you all of this. You know, I was around a lot of really kind of small minded people. So it, it made me fin for myself and I had to go and I, and it's probably a good thing, right? Because it gave me the chip on my shoulder and, you know, it's like, look, that's why I'm going to go buy the books. That's why I'm going to 
seek out the experts. It's why I'm going to go to the seminars. Um, but when I met Bill and just, he's always been so gracious with his time. You know, I've been lucky. I've come across a lot of people since that time that have been gracious. So what I would ask all of you to do, regardless of where you're at, like even our interns, like when you guys go back to wherever you're at, you're going to be an expert compared to somebody. So always take that information that you have and don't just hoard it. Don't keep it to yourself. Find ways to coach others, to teach others what you know, because I think that's how our, our industry is really going to get to the next level is by coaches that are serious, that are passionate about what we do, giving more back and finding ways to positively impact the industry. So is that good, Lance? Is that what you're hoping for? That's a lot like something Ty and I have been saying recently. And yeah. Our, our goal with IFSU, at least, like the, the big thing for me is every time I introduce myself to someone, they're like, what do you do for work? I don't want to say I'm a personal trainer because I feel like there's a terrible connotation to that word because personal trainers just like do this job until they're, you know, fat and out of shape and out of college or whatever. Right. It's like there's a lot that goes into it. And there's, I mean, the whole scope of the field is super broad. So yeah. I, I mean, I love that idea of having your mentor and guiding people and don't hoard the information because there's so much. It's all about the integration of, you know, sleep and nutrition and training and movement and speed and how does it change and Olympic lifting and whatever else, you know? So I'll, I'll give you one last point. Dave Tenney years ago at the Sounders Sports Science, you got to keep, keep in mind there's 60 dudes in this room, right? And Dave is managing one of the best teams in the MLS. But out of these 60, there's at least five or six other clubs that are represented, right? So there's his, comp his competition is in the room, and he's giving a presentation. And, you know, on one hand, I'm kind of thinking, dude, like, why is he giving – like, he's giving us his playbook. Why is he doing that? And he flat out said, I'm doing this because if I am going to sit up here and tell you guys what I'm doing, it's going to force me to continue to get better. And that really resonated with me. It's like, look, I'm not going to sit here and rest on my laurels and be okay with where I'm at. I'm going to show you exactly what I'm doing because that's going to force me to get out of my comfort zone and continue to grow and get better myself. So I don't know. That really resonated with me as well. So motivation 101. Let's go. It's 930. Go learn something. Except well, for not for Patrick. It's 530 over there, right? You're 630. Tired. 6.30 for me and Mitch. Oh, oh 6.30. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> we're the lucky ones. Well, you guys, I'm going to try to put this up uh, probably tomorrow. And if you want, you can just watch the end again, and then you'll be all motivated for the day. <laughs> yes, do that. <laughs> Same all time right, next guys. month? Ah? Same Mike time Rob? next month? Think I can uh, convince Mike Rob? I would do it again. Absolutely. I'll cool. do this he wasn't too annoyed by anyone. That sounds good. My baseball questions. <laughs> if he's on and take, he'll take baseball questions. Uh, no, I'm serious. I'm totally in. I love it. So <laughs> I, uh, I might try to get, I don't know if anybody wants to hear from him, but I want to hear Ty do one. <laughs> just to hear uh, what I'll he be says. down. I'll hear, <laughs> I will come to that too. Absolutely. Uh, Patrick, we love you. Um, we need more people like you. I love it. Uh, okay, guys, uh, I got to eat. Thanks for coming. See you next time. Bye, everybody. Thank Later. you. Thank you. See you. Thank you.